morning, everyone. Happy long weekend, everybody. Um, so glad that you're here this morning. Just as we were worshiping, I was just really aware that I am just so glad to be able to be here with all of you. Um, you know, Dave and I have been in Calgary now about nine years, and I'm just so happy to be your pastor. I, I just had like overwhelming gratitude for so many of you that um, have made Journey Church an amazing place to be. So thank you for being here. Well, I'm excited to jump back into the book of Daniel. Daniel one to, how many of you would say you really love prophecy? Yes, okay, well, more people than in the first service. In the first service, I asked this question and one lone person put up their hand. Um, okay, so uh, the book of Daniel one through six is like a bunch of really amazing stories and they're fun to talk about. Daniel seven and eight is how I promised. It gets a little weird in Daniel seven and eight. And um, I, I um, want you to know this though, that did you know that 25% of your Bible is pro prophecy? So like there's some of us that are like, you know, and I'm not really into that. But it actually, when we say that, we're saying we're not really into 25% of the Bible, which is problematic in a bunch of different uh, ways. For every mention of Jesus's first coming in the Bible, there are eight mentions of his second coming. Did you know that? And so this is why, actually, I, I'm convinced more than ever, although... Although when I planned to preach on Daniel a year ago, this seemed like a really good idea. I really easily convinced myself that, yes, our church needs to hear about this. And then when I actually got to writing the sermon, it was a little less convincing to myself. Um, but, but I am convinced more than ever that we actually need to, to tackle some of these hard chapters. Because what happens is when we don't, and we come to these in our Bible reading, we get to Daniel 7 and 8, and we go, ah. Uh. And if we do this in some of the chapters, what happens is it makes... Uh, we, we, this is exactly how we get to theological positions where we've cherry-picked things. And so I, I want to talk about Daniel chapter 7. I'm going to tell you to buckle up, though, today. I tried to preach this sermon to my children on a walk last night. They said, Mom, this sounds weird. I feel sorry for the people listening. So, okay. I want to start off, though, by asking this question. Why did God, and this is a question you actually have to ask about your Bible reading all the time. Why is this in the Bible? Why is Daniel chapter 7 and 8 even in here? Because we're going to find out in a minute that it's Daniel's dreams that are weird. Dave got up this morning and recounted to me in very descriptive detail his dream. It was not of God. It was just weird. One of you from the church was in a casket. Somebody was giving out floss, dental floss. It was weird. Um, I won't describe who it was. You don't need to know that. Not important. It was not from the Lord. It was just weird. So the question is, why did God put Daniel chapter 7 and 8, why did he allow Daniel to write down, and, and, and in other words, why did God even speak to Daniel this way? And there's a few reasons, I believe, um, that he did. The, the first one is this, God puts prophecy in the Bible because it proves that God is God. We're going to see in a few minutes that the dreams that Daniel had and the interpretations of those dreams hadn't even come to pass until 200 years, like Daniel was foretelling of things that would happen in the future that happened hundreds of years later. Prophecy is important because it reminds us that God is God, that we are not in control, but God is in control. The second thing it reminds us is that um, it shows us the creative nature of God. I was thinking about this a whole bunch this week because I was at a, a conference and there was a lot of business. And you know when people who love business and Robert's rules, if you're one of those people... Praise the Lord for you. Um, and there was a lot of 3.1, 0.2, 0.1, 0.17, 6,300. And I'm sleeping. I have toothpicks in my eyes. Try to keep them awake. And I was thinking while I was reading, uh, and I, concurrently I was reading Daniel 7 and 8, and I was thinking, God, why didn't you write it like that? Like, why didn't he just write, okay, chapter 7 of Daniel. I'm going to tell you some things that are going to happen in the future. Point one. Has anybody ever thought that? But it actually shows us the creative nature of God, that God is not just a linear person. If we are careful in the 21st, if we're not careful in the 21st century, what we will think is that God is just a linear person. And what we will attract to our churches is all the linear thinkers and who we will push out is all the creative people. But Daniel chapter 7 and 8 tells us that God is not just a right-brained God. He's also left-brained. And when you get to Daniel chapter 7, you'll see that God speaks in these really creative ways. 
He could have just said to Daniel, here's the point, but instead he gave him this wild dream that we're going to read in a minute about like leopards with wings on them and like all bears that are eating bones and weird, weird stuff. But it reminds us that God is creative. If you're here and you're a creative person, just know that the Bible from Genesis to Revelation tells us that God speaks in creative ways. He could have done it in a very linear way, but instead... He chose in Daniel chapter 7 and 8 to speak creatively. And finally, it shows us that God will speak to a variety of people in a variety of ways. What's cool about the Bible is that there's not one subtype of person. Like when we're categorizing people as humans, we try to say like, and this is a spiritual kind. I don't know what kind they are, but whatever comes to your mind. But this is, in fact, the opposite of what the Bible does. The Bible picks all kinds of people and speaks to them. This, and this is how I know that God can certainly, no matter who you are, no matter how strange the skeletons in your closet are, God can speak to you. That there is no one kind of just, that's the kind of spiritual person. God speaks to anyone and he speaks. And by the way, this is why we shouldn't be judgmental of each other and how God speaks to us. How God moves us. Because you're not me and I am not you. And the way that God speaks to you might be different than the way that he speaks to me. And that's biblical. If we all look the same, by the way, if we all look the same here in this place, I would say that we're verging. We can just be pretty sure we're not a biblical church. We should all look different. We should look like how the Bible looks. So Daniel chapter 7 and 8, I've given you the preamble of why it's going to be weird. Um, And uh, let me just set it up a little bit for us. We know that the first Chapter 2 through chapter 6 are all written in Aramaic. It's the only book in the Old Testament that's written in Aramaic. It's the language of the people of Babylon, which tells us that God's heart was for everybody right from the beginning. But then we get to Daniel chapter 7, and it, it jumps back into Hebrew, which tells us that this, these couple of chapters that we're going to go through over the next couple of weeks are written for the people of God. And they're written with the future in mind, reminding us to teach us how to look at the future if we're going to shine in the present. It is not enough for us to say, well, I'm living in the present, therefore I'm going to just be, you know, there's a whole thing that's happened in the world telling you all to be in the present at all times. And and there is some truth in it, of course. If you're always living ahead, you'll have problems. But the Bible actually calls us to be people who live with foresight. We should be some of the wisest people. We should be. The people of God should be the wisest people on earth because we've lived with the foresight of the Holy Spirit. Daniel chapter 7 and 8 call us to look to the future, how we are to position ourselves to look to the future so that we can shine in the present. Okay, here we go into Daniel chapter 7. We'll start at verse 2. It says, Daniel said, in my vision at night I was watching, and suddenly the four winds of heaven stirred up the great sea. Four huge beasts came up from the sea, each different than the other. Okay, so in the Old Testament, beasts always... Uh, uh, represent or their metaphors for governments, for world governments. So we're looking, Daniel, we already know right away. Daniel chapter 7, we're looking at four world governments. The first was like a lion, but had eagle's wings. Now, if your child told you this dream, you would go, "Uh uh-huh, uh-huh. And that's how some of you read this, by the way. You read it and go, okay, okay, next chapter. Okay, so the, the first was like a lion, but had eagle's wings. I continued watching until its wings were torn off. It was lifted up from the ground and set on its feet like a man and given a human mind. Okay, so this is Babylon here. And we know this, the wings getting torn off represent God humbling Nebuchadnezzar. Do you remember in in Daniel chapter 2, we talked about how God basically put Nebuchadnezzar in his place and said, you are not God, I am God. You're going to be, pretend you're a cow for seven years. And then, and then, um, and then he lifted up his head. The word is the same here. This is how we know it's Nebuchadnezzar. And he, um, he was restored. Okay, verse 5 says, Suddenly another beast appeared, a second one, that looked like a bear. It was raised up on one side with three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up, gorge yourself on flesh. Isn't the Bible such a nice, gentle book? <laughs> so gentle, and all the people that follow it just must be really, really weak people. Okay, this represents the Medo-Persian Empire which conquered Babylon. By the way, Babylon, uh, nobody expected Babylon to fall like it did, which is a reminder to all of us. It was only only going for 70 years, which in the historical time is not very long. 
totally full of opulence. This, this is a good reminder to us. You might be facing all kinds of problems right now. You might be feel held captive. And in just a moment, God can change everything. OK, so the bear represents the Medo-Persian Empire, which is conquered by Babylon. And we saw this in chapter 5. By the way, the timeline on Daniel. Daniel is not a linear book in that it doesn't go chronologically. In Daniel chapter 6, Daniel's about 90. Remember we talked about that throne in the lion's den, 90. And then Daniel chapter 7, he's only about 60. So it's a little bit like the Matrix. You kind of have to follow it like that. Again, God's not a linear God. Some of you don't think like that. And th this should be a great relief to you. OK. Um, the fact that the bear is larger on one side than the other represents the fact that Persia was bigger than the Mede Empire and would eventually take over the Mede Empire. Chapter, uh, verse 6 says, after this, while I was watching, suddenly another beast appeared. It was like a leopard with four wings of a bird on its back. It had four heads, and it was given dominion. This is where my kids checked out of this sermon. They were like, yeah. Um, and this, this third um, beast represents Greece under the leadership of Alexander the Great. Now, listen to me. When Daniel was having this dream, this was 200 years before Alexander the Great was a twinkle in his mother's eye. The leopard, though, represents the fact that Greece was the fastest conquering um, empire the world had ever seen. In fact, up to this day, it's the fastest. He, Alexander the Great, before he was 30, conquered the entire known world. Historians say that we've never seen a conqueror like him before and maybe never will. Um, in fact, in 323 BC, when Alexander conquered Persia, which was prophesied here, he brought with him only 35,000 soldiers to Persia's 100,000. Alexander the Great only lost 100 soldiers, and Persia lost 20,000. That tells you the force of Alexander's fighters. Uh, so he's the leopard with wings. Like, he's fast, and he can get everywhere. The four wings that become four heads prophesied that Alexander's kingdom would be divided between four generals. And this happened, by the way. And Alexander, after Alexander won, and there was a bitter power struggle between four of his generals. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But verse 7 says, after this, suddenly a fourth beast appeared, frightening and dreadful and incredibly strong with large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed, and it trampled with its feet whatever was left. It was different from all the beasts before it, and it had ten horns. Okay, so this fourth beast, of course, is Rome. It's the strongest uh, empire that the world had ever seen. They would conquer the Greeks. It has iron teeth, and it's representing Rome's incredible strength. For those of you that are his history buffs, Daniel chapter 7 is a weird way to teach history. <laughs> and, um, and then it says that it has 10 horns. Horns in the Bible always represent power. They usually represent power, the ability to damage. And this makes sense, right? How many of you have a pet here? Pet? Pets? OK, do any of your pets have a horn? Like, do any of you own a unicorn, a ram, a rhino? No. You know why? Because we like to keep furniture. And we like to keep our house. And we like to stay alive. Uh, horns always are destroyers. And so when these 10 horns, now if you grew up in the 80s, let me just speak to you. You had Jack Van Impey on your TV telling you forever what the 10 horns represent. That's not the point of this passage here. The point is the 10 horns would rise up from Rome, and they would create problems. OK. So, so far, this vision is weird, but not hard to track. It's often, it's like um, the dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had. Really, it feels very similar. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, so you had the gold head, which represented Babylon, and the silver, which represented the Medo-Persian Empire, and then Greece, and then Rome. It's, it's very similar, except for now we're going to have a little curveball thrown in, which is what the book of Daniel tends to do. Here's a little detail. Verse 8 says, while I was considering the horns, suddenly another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. And suddenly in this horn there were eyes like the eyes of a human and a mouth that was speaking arrogantly. So out of Rome comes a little horn, and this is our first prophecy about the Antichrist. Some of you have heard about the Antichrist before. The Antichrist is something that sets itself up against God. Notice that Daniel says the little horn has eyes like the eyes of a human. And they seem human, but when you look into them, there's something different. Now, okay, in terms of tone here, 
you should, you should hear scary music in verse 8. This is kind of like, and by the way, when you're reading the Bible, you need to read it with the, uh, you should be always asking yourself, what is the tone of this section? This is like the horror, cue the horror music, okay? I know that we're not supposed to say that in church, but this is, it will help you. He had a mouth that was speaking arrogantly. He boasted and blasphemed against God. Okay, now I want to move us to chapter 8. Chapter 7 and chapter 8 are like twin chapters. And then we're going to tie the threads. I, I'm promising you there are points that are going to make sense for your life in this. Okay, so in chapter 8, this, this time the vision is about a two-horned ram and a goat, where basically the ram gets pulverized by the goat as well. It's just a nice gentle dream that Daniel was having. 8.5 says, the goat came to the two-horned ram and rushed at him with savage fury. He struck the ram, and the ram was not strong enough to stand against him. The two-horned ram is, is clearly the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians, and the goat is Alexander the Great, who again was one of the most successful conquerors the world has ever seen. Again, let me just say to you that none of this happened while Daniel, uh, while Daniel was dreaming this. Now, now, if God can predict what the world governments are going to do hundreds of years before. Does he not certainly know what's happening in your life? This, this should give us a lot of like, okay, okay, God, if you've got all the world governments under control, I mean, I'm important, but like probably not that complicated. And you've got that under control? The male goat acted even more arrogantly, but when he became powerful, the large, large horn was broken. By the way, Alexander the Great died of alcoholism, historians think, by the time he was 30. Four conspicuous horns came up in its place, pointing towards the four winds of heaven, and we know about the four generals that came up. From one of them, a little horn emerged and grew extensively towards the south and the east and towards the beautiful land. And Daniel, in verse 16, it says, I heard a human voice calling, Gabriel, explain the vision to this man. This must have been a relief to Daniel because he's already seen these weird visions. Verse 16 might have been his life verse. So he approached where I was standing. When he came near, I was terrified and fell face down. Son of man, he said to me, understand that the vision refers to the time, to the time of the end. This is important for us to see. The shaggy goat represents the kingdom of the king of Greece. By the way, this is before Greece had risen as a major power. And the large horn between his eyes represents the first king, which would be Alexander the Great. The four horns that took the place of the broken horn represent four kingdoms. They will rise from that nation, but without its power. Um, okay, so then when we get to verse 23, let's read this together. Near the end of their kingdoms, when the rebels have reached the full measure of their sin, a ruthless king, skilled in intrigue, will come to the throne. His power will be great, but it will not be his own. He will cause outrageous destruction and succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy the powerful along with the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper through his cunning and by his influence. And in his own mind, he will exalt himself. He will destroy many in a time of peace. He will even stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be broken, but not by human hands. Okay, so out of those four horns of Greece, a ruthless small horn would arise who would be especially cunning and violent and especially vicious towards God's people. And sure enough, in 170 BC, a man named Antichus Epiphanes arose from out of one of the four subdivided kingdoms of Greece. Antichus Epiphanes, in historical language, is called the Hitler of the Old Testament. He killed women and children, hundreds of thousands of people. He slaughtered them for absolutely no reason. He had coins that were inscribed... Um, with King Antichus, the, the God in flesh. And he went into Jerusalem, into the Holy of Holies, and made God's people come in there and worship him and eat pork. Now, to us, that doesn't... But if you remember Leviticus, that was against the Levitical law. He was an abomination uh, to the people of God. They, they would have been living with Antichus Epiphanes, remembering Daniel chapter 7 and chapter 8. But you remember the, the scripture we just read said that human hands were not going to take him out. It would be God himself. And we know from history that Antichus Epiphanes was rising. He was a dictator. And all of a sudden, one day, he got a stomach flu, and then he died. This is a true thing. This actually happened historically. 
If you were living in the days of Daniel, you would have read, or the days after, 200 years after, you would have thought, <clears throat> how did they know that? This is why prophecy is important, because it reminds us that God is on the throne, that he is real. Uh, by the way, a lot of these events are written about in the Apocrypha. It, it's not biblical, but it is historical knowledge that is interesting to read about if you're interested in history. The point is, it's safe to say that Antiochus Epiphanes was the specific fulfillment of this prophecy in Daniel chapter 7, but let me, I want to show you something really interesting about how later Bible writers treat this prophecy because it teaches us a couple of very important things about prophecy. Okay, so first of all, uh, even though the events of Daniel 8 were clearly fulfilled by Antiochus Epiphanes, both Jesus, the Apostle John, and Paul, who all lived 200 years after Antiochus Epiphanes, used Daniel 8 to point to something still further in the future, uh, namely the rise of the Antichrist. Even though Antiochus Epiphanes clearly fulfilled this prophecy, they say, hey, listen, there, there's something even, there's an Antichrist coming that's going to be even further in the future. And this is how we know we can apply these scriptures um, to what happens in Revelation. Okay, so this leads me to my first point. And we're going to get there in 14 minutes and 49 seconds. We're going to land the plane. The first is this. The prophecies, I know it's laughable. It is laughable. The prophecies about the Antichrist are already and not yet fulfilled. By the way, the entire book of Revelation is built on Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8. You cannot read, you, Revelation will make zero sense to you if you don't understand Daniel chapter 7 and 8. And, and that's why it's important that we study it and that we know it. Um, for many prophecies, there's both in the, in the scriptures, there's both a near fulfillment and a far one. And the near fulfillment gives you a picture of the far one. So like I would sort of make it akin to like when you go um, to the Rocky Mountains, you know, if we were to look out these windows right now, it looks like, doesn't it look like all the mountains are in like a beautiful row? And you think, if I climb to one, I could jump to the other one. And then you climb up a mountain, or in my case, a hill, and you realize that all the other peaks are like, looks like hundreds and hundreds of miles away. And this is kind of true about biblical prophecy. When you're looking at 10,000 feet, it looks like they're all very close together, but they can be separated by thousands of years. Um, if um, the Bible presents these peaks together, but there's a near fulfillment and a far one, Antichrist Epiphanes uh, was a picture of what the ultimate Antichrist would look like. And we know this. We don't have time to look at it today, but if you go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul talks all about this. He, he uses Daniel 8 imagery to remind us that there is an Antichrist that is coming at the end of days. And we can actually look to what historically happened in Daniel chapter 8 to tell us what that Antichrist is going to look like. My point is here that the prophecies of Daniel 7 and 8 are both behind us and before us. Antichrist was the first fulfillment, and the Antichrist is the ultimate one. Um, the first one, Antichrist, sets some patterns which will be fulfilled in the final coming of the Antichrist. Uh, which leads me to my second point, which might be even more important than the first, that is this. In every age, the spirit of Antichrist is at work. We know this from 1 John. 1 John 2.18 says, children, it is the last hour. And I would say that this is true of us. We need to hear this as words spoken to us right now. And as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. Christian theology states, believes that at, at a time that we do not know, Jesus will come back. But before that time, an Antichrist will rise that will deceive a lot of people. But what we know from the New Testament is that there are all kinds that the spirit of Antichrist is alive and well. And I mean, we know this. This is not shocking. You just have to watch the news. Uh, people that tell me, well, I don't believe in a devil, I think, I don't, I don't think you're living in the world right now. I don't know where you're living, in Candyland, apparently. I, I actually have never had a person that doesn't know Jesus argue with me on this point. I think Christians get worried that we sound like weirdos, but like actually people in the world are like, yeah, there must be something evil out there because we've all experienced that at some level. In Mark chapter 14, verse 62, uh, Jesus takes the prophecies of Daniel in, in verse 7 and 8, and he says, hey, listen, you guys are all acting like the Antichrist right now, and this is how we know that we can apply these verses this way. These 
these chapters teach us something about what the Antichrist is up to. Now, it is important that we know this as Christians because otherwise the, the Bible tells us that we will be deceived by the enemy's schemes. And um, there is nothing, have you ever been lied to before? And then you find out you were lied to? Oh, there is nothing worse. Like if you want to see me throw up on command, that is the way to do it. When your children lie to you, oh, it's like, mm. it, it, but, but this is why we actually have to know what the enemy's up to so that we will not be deceived. We are easily, as people, we are easily deceived, are we not? Yes. I mean, the truth is, in the 21st century, you, you, re, you open up your computer and read things, and like, none of us, is that true? I don't know. We take a side, not because we know, but because we like go with what feels right in our gut. Okay, so the first thing that the Antichrist is up to is he, he aims to devour much flesh. And that's not hard to believe. Just look at the last 100 years, and you'll know that that's true. We're the most technologically advanced, but did you know that the 21st century has also been the most bloody? The 20th century was the most bloody century that humans have ever experienced. And I don't need to go through all the things, the Holocaust. I could name you a list of all the horrible things that we've had to live through. Suffice to say that, the, um, that as Christians, we actually have to stand on the side of peace. We must pray for peace. We must believe for peace. We must ask the Lord for peace because it is the work of Antichrist to devour flesh. There should never be a time. I, I remember when the Gulf War happened and I was um, just a young adult at the time and Christians I knew were having like war parties because Jesus was going to come back again. That, that's the spirit of Antichrist, ladies and gentlemen praying that the war would happen. Jesus said, we're to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We're to pray for the peace and prosperity of the places we live. That is the spirit of Jesus inside of us. That doesn't mean that we lay down and play dead and say like, well, whatever's happening in the world doesn't matter. But it means we get on our knees and we say, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because anything less than that is the spirit of Antichrist. And we know that the spirit of Antichrist doesn't just come to devour flesh, but he comes to deceive. This is why, as Christians, we must be led with the peace of God. Um, the, the deception that's happened in our nations and in our world over the last little bit, like, do you remember when you found out that all news was not real? And our kids are constantly laughing at Dave and I because we're like, Yesterday, Dave is looking at the thing. He's like, wow, there's a plane now that has a glass floor. And if you saw that meme yesterday, and um, our kids let us go on about this. Yeah, I see some of you hanging your heads like, oh. There's so much deception, though, out there. Dave and I are like, how can we get a ticket to go on this plane? And, and our oldest daughter said to us, Dad, why do you keep getting duped by this? I'm so I thought that you could get a big giant dog that was as big as a house, and I realized now that was just somebody who does computer programming or something, makes pictures. There's so much deception. And, and, and if we're not careful, though, we, we, we actually can't get in fear over that. What we have to do is ask the Lord to bring us a spirit of peace, because a spirit of peace will combat deception. Whenever you get to feeling like, I'm not feeling right about that. This is where, like, I, I, this is the thing I teach my kids. If you don't know what decision to make, you have to ask the Lord to make his peace be known to you. The Bible tells us that we're led by peace. The third thing the Antichrist does, it says that he exalts himself above anybody else. The obsession that our culture has with self is a sure sign of the spirit of Antichrist. And these three things we've got to push against. We've got to say, God, would you help me to humble myself before you? Would you help me to take the, the low road? Would you help me? I mean, that's hard. it's hard to do. Can we just admit that that's hard to do in a culture that tells you to make everything about you? Make everything about you. Make yourself the main character. Don't be a non, I don't know, like just make yourself the center of the universe. But we are battling not just flesh and blood. That is the spirit of Antichrist that we must battle against. We must pray that God will help us to, to be led by peace. So in our age, we can experience, we can expect to encounter the spirit of Antichrist. You can expect to encounter it every day for the rest of your life. Aren't you glad you came to church today? And that's the bad news. It's not going to get any better. It's, in fact, going to get worse, culminating with the, with the Antichrist that we see in the book of Revelation. Somebody who will come and exalt their name 
above the name above all names. He, he will try to exalt his name. But you can see that the world is going this way. This, is not, this should not come as like big old surprise to any of us. Of course this will culminate in one person trying to take over. But the good news is this, even in the age of the Antichrist, the Ancient of Days still rules. And this is the main point I want to make today. I want to take you back to Daniel chapter 7 and show you what Daniel says in the midst of all these prophecies about darkness and judgment. By the way, imagine you're living there in Babylon. Daniel's having these prophecies, and there's prophecies about leopards with wings, and the wings are going to be pulled off of it. And every, I mean, the people that were listening to these prophecies are like us. Imagine if I stood up here and stood, everybody, I've had a dream last night. In five years, all of our countries were going to be taken. You're going to have to go in a cage. Uh, you're, it's going to be the worst. All, many of your children are going to be slaughtered. Enjoy your life. Well, if I was credible, <laughs> if I was credible, I, a lot of us would, would go and build a bunker this afternoon. And there would be great fear. And Daniel knew this. And the Lord actually gave him this part of the dream. Let me read this. And I want you to read it, understanding how you would have felt hearing these dreams. Verse 9 says, As I kept watching, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white like snow, and the hair of his head the whitest wool. His throne was flaming fire. Its wheels were blazing fire. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from his presence. Thousands upon thousands served him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was convened and the books were opened. Here in the midst of all this calamity, calmly coming to take his place as the judge is the Ancient of Days. I mean, he is not frantic. The Bible's very clear in Daniel chapter 7 that he takes the book and he sits down. I mean, when I sit down, it's when I've done everything. I know that the day's work is done. God is not frantically moving about. In your life right now, I want you to know that everything might be swirling around you, but this has not taken God off guard at all. He is sitting down, convened as the Ancient of Days. Do you know, um, I love that the name he gives himself there, the Ancient of Days. Because you know, um, if you have kids or you've been around kids and they try to dupe you into things, I often will say this word, I wasn't born yesterday. I was cool five minutes ago. <laughs> Clearly I don't know anything about the internet anymore, but I, I wasn't born yesterday. And in some ways, when God calls himself the Ancient of Days, he was saying, I was never born at all. I've never had to learn anything. I've never known, I've never not known anything. There is nothing in your life that has taken him by surprise. Absolutely nothing. He is the ancient of days. If he knows what is happening with every world government, he certainly knows what's happening with your life. And these prophecies that Daniel bring us should in fact cause us to not only be in awe of God, but he can predict things hundreds of years before they happen, thousands of years before they happen, but that he is in total control. Part of the metaphor that it uses, it says, his hair is white as snow, which means he carries all the authority and wisdom of the ages. Listen, some of you are in need of great wisdom right now. You're at a place that you don't know what to do. You don't know what decision to make. You don't know what to say. I, I want you to see that God is sitting on the throne he is sitting on the throne with, with you in mind. It says that his clothes are white like the purest wool, which means he is pure and wise and righteous altogether without the slightest blot of imperfection. His throne blazes in fire, which means it consumes all before it. By the way, uh, I like this section because it says that God's wheels, his throne, he has wheels on his throne. Matt, this is for you. And it means that God can like he, it, some theologians say that it's because God is not unpresent for us. He's not like sitting in a stationary chair saying like, you and your problems, deal with them, man. You're, no, no, he's actually able to move towards us. And they're on fire, so it just sounds cool, like a, like a monster truck. Oh. It's interesting to look at how all the events that Daniel predicted, which seemed so dark at the time, actually worked out for the furtherance of God's purposes. 
I want you to see this for a second. When Persia took over Babylon, did you know that Persia actually rebuilt Jerusalem? And often, if you've ever gone to Israel before and you've seen a rebuilt Jerusalem, that's thanks to Persia. Thank you, bear with bones in your mouth. Uh, they paid it. They paid for it and everything. Both Jerusalem and the temple would be crucial for Jesus' ministry. And then God raised up Greece, and they united the world under one trade language, Koinonia Greek. It's what your Bible, the original language of your Bible, was written in. And the whole world learned to speak Koinonia Greek, and it's why the Bible actually mattered to people in the ancient days. And it, it made it much easier for the gospel to spread rapidly throughout the world in the writings of the apostles. Imagine if the apostle Paul was writing, writing to Colossus, and they spoke a different language than they spoke in to the Galatian church. It would have been impossible. And then God rose up, rose up the, the empire of Rome, and the Romans built a system of roads that made it possible to transport the gospel from place to place. If you've come, uh, any of us who found Jesus in North America, we can thank the Roman Empire for that. Any of you who found Jesus in, in the southern parts of Africa, you can thank the Roman Empire for that. The point is, God can use everything, 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 things in your life that look so scary right now and you don't know how to take a step forward. I'm telling you that our God is a God sitting as the ancient of days and he is using everything for your good. There is nothing that is happening in your life right now that is outside his control. There's nothing happening in your marriage right now that he is not unaware of. There is nothing that's happening at your job right now that he cannot see. He is the ancient of days, and he uses this all for his glory. In the first service, I uh, told the story about Dawson Trotman. He started a ministry called The Navigators. Are any of you here part of The Navigators? Yeah, okay, I'm going to get you to stand up in a minute. In the first, it was really great because I didn't know how this was going to work in the first and second service. I knew we had navigators in the church, but okay, let me tell you this story. Dawson Trotman um, went to jail, and uh, he found Jesus in jail, and then he came out. This is typical. I mean, this is a story that still happens every day uh, in, all over the world. He found Jesus in jail, and then he came out, and he got a job at a Texaco gas station. Okay, so he got a regular job. This is not a job. If your child went to jail, found Jesus, got a job at a gas station, you'd not be saying, and they're going to light the world on fire. You'd just say, thank God they're not in jail. So he, um, he found one or two people that, um, that would, would these sailors would come into the gas station. I'm not sure why, maybe to get chips. I'm not really sure. It was the 1940s, and it was um, everything was cheap. So they came in, and Dawson Trotman, who was working at the Texaco gas station, told these people about Jesus, these two young men about Jesus. And the two young men came to know Jesus, which is amazing. I mean, he's an evangelist now. And they brought their friends, saying, uh, we'll, we'll give you a little bit of food. So they brought two people. Now, the two people, historically, were not coming to the gas station for the Bible study. They came to the, some of you got tricked into coming to church this way. They came for the food, and um, they, but after a long while, they, they came to Jesus. Okay, so four of them. This is a true revival has happened now, everyone. Four people have come to Jesus. Well, these missionaries were going to be deployed on the SS West Virginia, and um, they said to Dawson, who ostensibly had become a very good Bible teacher at this point, listen, why don't you come on the boat with us? And we'll give you some of our money so that you can live on the boat. Now, if you're Dawson's parents, you're thinking this is a terrible idea. That's not even a job. You're going to be, you're going to have a Bible study on the boat. That's the job. Okay. So, anyways, Dawson gets on this boat with four people, and um, they, at one point, um, he was telling them, "God is going to change the world through you." Okay. But it's kind of like me getting up here every Sunday morning and saying, "Listen, at your job in your cubicle." You can change the world this week. And I know what your eyes do when I say things like that. You do long blinks. I know when you're sleeping, by the way. I know when you're sleeping. Anyways, okay, so, so they get on this boat. And, um, and by a, a year ago, six months later, there's been 100 conversions. I mean, this really is something that's happening here. 100 conversions and twice that many meeting regularly for Bible study. And they start calling themselves the Navigators. And the name of the ship was the U.S. West Virginia. And just a few months after the Bible study really got going, 
They got deployed, the ship got deployed to a place called Pearl Harbor. You know where this is going. And then it sunk on December 7th, 1941. It sounds like a tragedy, right? Some young kid who worked at a Texaco station saw some people come to Jesus and then the ship sunk. But all those sailors in the Navigator's Bible study got redeployed onto other ships. By the end of the war, there were 800 ships that had Bible studies led by the Navigators. There would not have been a person on earth that when that ship sunk would have said, wow, glory to God, the ship sunk. That would have been crass and rude and like not understanding people's pain. And these young men, they came back to the United States and under the GI Bill, they were spread out into universities across the nation and began leading Bible studies on campuses. And this resulted in formation, the formation of groups like InterVarsity and Campus Crusade. And today, right here in our church, both in the first service and the second service, would you stand up if you're part of the Navigators? Yeah, yeah we're gonna clap for you in a second. Yeah, can we clap for these guys? Okay, so these young people have like, they're, they're continuing the legacy that has gone on for a hundred years that should have been a tragedy. Listen, whatever tragedy is in your life, this is Daniel 7 and 8 straight through. This is the message of Daniel 7 and 8, that everything might be going down the drain and God can use it. God can use it if you will let him. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people have said yes to Jesus because some guy got saved in jail and went to work at a Texaco gas station and took two people on. This is the Ancient of Days that we serve. The things that look so painful. And, and that's not negating the fact that your life might be very painful right now. But the Ancient of Days is still able to use it. He's not put off by your tragedy. In a presentation years later, Dawson was talking about his ministry success and he said, the need of the hour is just to believe that God is God, that he's the Ancient of Days, that he sits upon a throne and will be true to his purposes in all times, in all places, and will be true to us if we are obedient to his will. God's calling to us today, he said, is to recognize that our circumstances, as difficult as they may be, as hard as they are to understand, do not counteract the eternal truth that our God sits on a throne. Listen to what Daniel 7 and 8, 7 verse 11 tells us. I watched then, Daniel said, because of the sounds of the arrogant words the horn was speaking. And as I continued watching, and suddenly one like, the, like a son of man was coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days and was escorted before him. He was given dominion and glory and a kingdom so that those of every people, every nation and every language should serve him. This is why as a church, we are committed to every language, every people, every nation. This is the call of revelation. Right here in Daniel chapter seven, we see that the whole story is tied together. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Mark my words today, no matter what you are facing, his kingdom will not be destroyed. He will not be made a liar in your life. He will be faithful to his word. He will be faithful to the things that he has spoken over you. He will accomplish his word in your life. And this is why on a Sunday morning, a long weekend of a Sunday morning, we can say that we trust him that we trust him, that the prophetic words that he spoke in Daniel that came to pass have the same power as the words that have been spoken over your life. His kingdom will last. Can we stand this morning? I want to call you unapologetically to say yes to Jesus this morning, to say yes to the parts 
Listen, Jesus doesn't just call us to, to acknowledge him as like somebody nice or like he wears robes. and He calls us to acknowledge him as the ancient of days, the one who can control everything in our lives. And the call to be a Christian is to lay down ourselves, to die to ourselves and say, God, you are in control. But when we do that, we are not giving up ourselves. We were saying, God, I'm laying myself down so that you can make something more of me than I ever could on my own. I'm calling you to that radical kind of yes to Jesus today. With every head bowed and all eyes closed, some of you have never said yes to Jesus in that kind of radical way before. You never laid down everything before him. I wanna call you to do that today. It's simply, you see, the way to Jesus is easy. We just say yes. The laying down of ourselves actually takes courage. And this is what the book of Daniel is all about, that we would have courage to say yes to him in every, as every aspect of our lives. If you're here today and you've never done that, I, I wanna pray with you. I'm not gonna point you out. I just wanna pray with you. I'm just gonna ask that at the count of three, you would just raise your hand. Maybe you've come to church for a thousand, you've come a thousand times, but you've never ever made Jesus the Lord of your life, the one who is in charge. I want you to, to declare that to him today. Jesus said that if you declare me before men, that I will declare you before my Father. I will acknowledge you before my Father. So on the count of three, one, two, and three. Would there be anybody here? Yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks. Anybody else? Don't let this day pass. Yep, thanks. Yep, don't let this day pass. This is the, the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. Don't wait till tomorrow. He is the ancient of days today. Why let your life just go into chaos when he can take control of it? So for the sake of the person on your left and your right, can you just pray this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die on a cross for my sins. Thank you that you are the ancient of days that you control everything. You control my life. You know all the details of my life. I give you, I put you in charge. Thank you. Help me to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Others, those of you who are here and you've come in in turmoil, I, I just in this moment as we sing, I'm just going to ask that, the, that you would encounter the Lord in a real way. There's something different that happens when we actually have this rhema moment. Rhema is a, is a Greek word, a koinonia word. Thank you, Alexander the Great. That, uh, that reminds us that there is a now word for us, that we can get something now that like changes the way we live out our life tomorrow. So God, I just pray for my friends. I pray for all of us today that we would have divine revelation that you are the ancient of days that we would actually come to more than head understanding, but also heart understanding, that you are controlling everything and that we can trust you, that we can trust you. We can trust you in tragedy. We can trust you in the valley. God, we can trust you in every part of our lives. As we sing now, God, may you, uh, may you encounter us in a real way, in Jesus' name.